studio. Jane is the COO of the Noakes Foundation, the Managing Director of Nutrition Network, the superhuman behind the EBSA, which is the Eat Better South Africa initiative, and basically one of the driving forces behind the nutrition revolution in South Africa. A former colleague of mine from when Real Meal and the Noakes Foundation were married back in the day. And Jane, <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here to talk to us about fake food, lies, myths, and fraud. Welcome. Thank you. So cool to be here. Always cool to chat to you. So we've got the World Nutrition Summit coming up in uh, this weekend. And for those of you who are watching the recording, you can still go check it out because there's actually a post in the summit recording or uh, thing that you can go check out. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're watching this live, in the links attached to this, sorry, I lost my ability to speak English, in the links attached to this webinar or, or discussion, there's more information on the World Nutrition Summit. So go check it out after the show. But Jane is giving a talk on fake food, lies, myths, and fraud. But before we go there, I want us to rewind, because some people see us like this uh, demigod in, in the no, NGO space. But I'd like to speak about what you did before you moved into the NGO space. Thanks for asking that, John. It really ties into the talk that I'm giving at the summit. Um, so I worked for 20 years as a marketer, brand researcher, and consumer researcher. Um, and it started, you know, I start, my first job was working, I, I was really lucky because I spoke French. So I was put on, I was an international brand manager for Tiger Brands, who owned a, a little pharmaceutical company that South Africans will know called Adcock Ingram. Oh, and wow. what we were doing at the time was we were go we were expanding into international territories. Mm -hmm. So I was tasked with taking a basket of uh, analgesics and some other scheduled drugs into southern and east Africa. Um, and it was the most extraordinary time and it was the most amazing start to a career because I used to go and travel to those territories and walk around state hospitals and, and pharmacies in the local places and try to understand what we needed to do in terms of how to launch a brand into those countries. And it was also kind of open territory days, so you could do a lot of very little. So we used to go and take over entire pharmacies with things like Compral headache tablets. Um, we used to play around and explore with the most unbelievable campaigns. And we would also advertise and market directly into hospital chains and directly into like state hospital channels. So I learned a huge amount about the value of research and just how to understand like how consumers perceive and digest brands in those years. It was incredible. And then from there I went on, you know, 20 fast Fast forward 20 years later, I'd kind of worked in, I moved much more into consumer research and shopper research towards the time before I joined the Notes Foundation. And what astounded me when I moved into the NGO sector and followed my passion and kind of desire to change and improve the health of the world and my own health was how tiny the budgets were. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. I thought that there were a couple of zeros knocked off the first few <laughs> recent study budgets that I came across and kind of phoned the researchers and went like, is this correct? Are you actually doing this research with this little money? You know, it was, it was shocking. So it yeah. really fueled my passion. My career in, in corporate really fueled my passion to go into the sector because I realized how little knowledge and how little marketing knowledge sits in the NGO sector or certainly did at the time seven years ago and I know that's changing mm. um, so so I'm, I'm giving a talk that's around you know actually what, how marketing works and how yeah. brand and how consumer research works and I don't think a lot of people know that and certainly in medicine I know for sure that a lot of people don't understand how it works and how we, how it all ties together and how yeah. we persuade people to actually choose what they choose and to buy what they buy. Okay, well, so give us a little bit there on the fake food front. So wh what is a fake food and how does that link well, to, to marketing? Well, I mean, okay, so <laughs> obviously there are varying degrees of it and we eat a lot of fake food. So we eat foods that are like bulk foods, full of foods. Um, it really depends on the way that you look at it. But if you start to actually understand, so I pulled out, I literally pulled out a couple of examples from my weekend. So, so just oh, yeah. uh, bulk food and uh, and filler food, is that yes. marketing jargon or is so no. what, you know, what, what well, discipline so, is that from? So this is, I mean, I'm talking about now how when we buy something that's considered to be a healthy food or is yeah. positioned as a healthy food, what we're actually often buying is something that's not that's that's positioned and marketed in a way that is completely either fake misleading, deceptive, or outright fraudulent. Like there's a scale that we're going to talk about. 
Um, you know, and then we know this. So it's like there's so many. I mean, I talk about a lot of examples in my talk, but you know, there's the typical things like obviously there's the greenwashing of things. So if you put a bowl of, of high carb cereal or sugary cereal and chuck a few blueberries into it, the consumer perceives that to be a healthy food. Like instinctively, we're wired in certain ways where we make associations. And of course, there's no one, I mean, marketers know this. Marketers are very, very clever people like you or I who understand how consumers' brains work. And, you know, I think an important thing is it, it, when I say fake foods, I'm not saying that like every brand manager in the world that's sitting there at their desk at Tiger Brands and all of the big guys are actually deliberately misleading customers. That's not quite how it works. You know, I mean, you could indirectly, you could accuse them of that. But on the most part, a marketeer or a brand manager gets into a job, they adopt and inherit a brand that's been around for a very long time. So like, for example, at Tiger Brands, you know, you look at the Tiger Brands, for those watching from overseas, is our biggest um, sort of food manufacturer locally in South Africa, or one of our biggest. And it has so a lot Unilever. of local brands. Yeah, it's like our Unilever of South Africa. So they have things like Jungle Oats, which is one of our oldest and most established oat brands. They have a lot of our maize and pup brands, and most of the big bread comes from them and that brand manager is you know whatever a typical sort of 20 25 year old ambitious top of their class and marketing big ideas big visions person that gets put into this job they adopt this brand that comes with a huge history and their job is to, to make it sell well and to do for, to grow the brand and they do yeah. their job so they understand yeah. what they're doing they know their customer very well they do market research they do consumer research they grow the brand and it keeps going and these brands take on kind of a life force of their own so you know like being a parent you become a short-term custodian to a brand and then you move on and hopefully a year or two later you sort of do well and you promote it or you do badly and you chuck it onto a lower grade brand or however it works they're not necessarily individuals who are kind of out to get the health of the world um, yeah, it's I know. A complex yeah. Than that. yeah you're like you sit in, in a in a in a room with a whole lot of creative people and you're like how can we make jungle oats which by the way are on the red list because they contain gluten but uh, mm -hmm. jungle oats <laughs> so, <laughs> so so you're sitting there with jungle oats and you're like um how can we make this the most awesome thing ever and uh, and i know like as you know when i was a creative in the wine industry you you would literally say like are we allowed to say this can we say this because if yeah. we can say it then it's like super awesome and it'll definitely sell it's not like um someone sitting there going well we're going to poison them but we're not going to tell them it's like yes. the other way around it's, yes, more it's excitement really and not like that and it's also yeah. really important to remember that actually the, you know typical brand managers and marketeers represent the demographics that they're selling to so in south africa that's about 80 percent women that do the grocery shopping um, and their moms, they are people like myself who go through, you know, push that trolley, stressed out, sending emails, doing 10 different things at the same time that they're walking through the grocery store. They grab, they, they see healthy things, they grab them and off they go. And they think that they're doing the best thing they can for their children. So they're, we're very um, sort of deceptible is probably the word. And we're quite easily influenced and we're all trying our best. So, so it's like, you know, that brand manager sitting at that desk isn't out there to, as I said, like kill the world or kind of create a diabetes tsunami. But incidentally, by making decisions in an unconscious way and as shoppers by buying products in unconscious ways, we are co-contributors to it, of course. And this is an example just before this meeting. I have to show this quickly. I won't mention yeah. the brand name too much. But on the weekend, cool. I was so excited. I saw a matcha tea brand, and I love matcha tea. And I bought this. It was like 90 Rand, which is quite a lot for a little bag of tea. And I made, I, I took it out to make myself some before this. And then I looked, and I was like, okay, here we go. Ingredients, white sugar, glucose, creamer, matcha, creamer, matcha powder, barley grass powder, brilliant blue flavoring and coloring, tartrazine, sunset yellow, silicon dioxide, boom. So, you know, I thought like much is a healthy brand. I'm going to grab a bag of this and make myself some and make it, convert my son to drinking it. And now I'm sitting with this in my grocery cupboard. That's like yeah. the, a toxic time bomb of diabetes yeah. waiting to happen. And it was not deliberate, you know. That's how easily we can be grab things that we think are healthy and we make these associations. That's amazing. That's what we would call sneaky, sneaky. Yes. Uh, in, at, so it's one of the 10 principles of RMR eating is like no sneaky, sneaky. So that's like taking control. So now is your talk more aimed at um, the consumer or is it aimed at the professionals or is it aimed at industry? 
So it's somewhere. just it's, so what I'm going to do in my talk is I'm really going to talk through the history of marketing and some examples of where food marketing began. So I'm looking at like those early days of sugar ads and how they started, you know, where it was like sugar's healthy and then half a grapefruit and it's excellent for weight loss. I've actually got an ad, I actually posted it this afternoon yeah. where it actually says sugar is excellent for weight loss and you yeah. should have sugar it's throughout craving. the day. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> And it's like in those days, there was very little regulation. And of course, over time, we've moved somewhat in the direction of better regulation. But that's also debatable because, again, there's an incredibly um, intelligent way of marketing products as being healthy. And we know that. So if you look at South Africa in the diabetes game, there's probably about 10, 15 breakfast cereals that are recommended by our local diabetes organization, Diabetes SA. Um, and it's all the things that are sort of, you know, whole grain, oats, sh sugar-free. But when we, certainly when we test them on type 2 diabetics, they're, they're pretty much the same as having a good old bowl of something with a bit of sugar in. There's not much difference. But of mm. course, in the consumer's mind, they sort of have their bowl of oats and think like, cheapest I've been so healthy. But banana on this, I've had my one of my five a day. And that's just like brilliant. I'm going to be amazing and healthy all day. And what we yeah. know, certainly what you know, and what a lot of diabetics now know is that that's a, to a toxic time bomb. You know, it's going to absolutely clock their insulin and their, their blood glucose way over where it should be. And yeah. they don't understand that. So where does the responsibility lie? Or at least where does the role... Um... Yeah, I suppose where does the responsibility lie between the consumer and the brand and the regulator? How does that relationship work and how do you think it should work? Well, so it should work a lot better than it does. And we see different examples of this in different countries. Um, yeah. In South Africa, it doesn't work. I, I, would, I would argue and say that it probably doesn't work at all at the moment. Mm. So if you actually want to in South Africa, as we've seen from some examples that I'll give in my talk, there are some bakeries and some local brands that are pretending to be completely sugar-free and gluten-free, but are actually selling like cake. And and have yeah. been doing it for 10 years and getting away with it. And nothing has been done about it. So there's a, there's a worst case scenarios and then there's kind of a, a diluted degree and different countries and different continents are better that better at it but what we're also seeing is that healthcare marketing and branding is merging with food so you know in the old days the chemist used to be very separate from the grocery store and now yeah. typically they've merged into one and you do your groceries and your your drug shopping or your pill shopping in the same place so that's a very interesting complexity that's been added to the mix and makes it a lot easier to blur the lines between health food marketing and medication marketing is that, um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that like healthcare <laughs> moving closer to food or is that like food moving out of food and into like well, nutrients well. rather than... Yeah, I would say it's a combination of both because what you can do now is you can buy like fake food that has no nutritional value, but then you can pop around the corner and get an incredibly expensive array of vitamins that are going to supplement the food that you're not getting and fortify that. And then you can also get your prescription at the pharmacist right there that's going to help control your blood or control your blood sugar at the same time. So it's complicated. I think what it's doing is it's further complicating the shopper's mind. Um, mm. And we we come in in a very cluttered space in our minds at the moment and in today's world. Um, and I'm going to talk about that and how the sort of macroeconomic cycle of things impacts marketeers and how we use that to sell products. So, you know, if you look at what's happened in the last couple of years, panic buying is a great example of that. People panic bought all the basic needs. You know, they panic bought toilet paper, milli meal and pup, um, long life carbohydrates, sugar, all of those kinds of things that are sort of the lower, if we're talking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're on the lower echelons of that, that triangle or that pyramid. And, you know, we've, it's become very cluttered. The consumer space has become very cluttered. The average person has exposure to between eight and 15,000 adverts a day in today's world. Is that um, in the so U.S.? Is that the that's U.S.? An, yeah, that's a U.S. Yeah, figure. Yeah. So, and I'll show some of that data. And that's, of course, exacerbated by digital media and the fact that we're actually consuming advertisements as we're in a shop and are exposed to such immense brand load as we go through our yeah. daily lives without realizing it. And that, of course, makes it easier to confuse and complicate the consumer's mind. We, we are cluttered and overwhelmed, and we actually don't know what's healthy. It's amazing because I think like with social media, there's also unintentional advertising. So, you know, you get like your influencer who's paid by a brand to, to um, show people mm -hmm. stuff. But like, I, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not like advertising where I'm telling people what I'm eating and whatever. 
And, uh, and I know like all my mates, you know, if they're at a jaw or whatever, they'll put a picture up of them eating. And then on the table, you'll see the bottle of wine. It's not a brand placement, but it, yeah. it, it's, it's not different from a brand placement. It's still an Absolutely. advertisement. And people are Absolutely. constantly assessing like, what are my friends doing? What have they got? What brands are they using? Exactly. So, yeah, totally. <sighs> yeah, that's yeah, scary. It's, it's hugely complex. And it's also, I mean, I'm just thinking of just this weekend because I haven't properly unpacked my bags yet. But, you know, when you're talking of blurring the lines, so my sister lives in Colorado and she bought me a bottle of melatonin because it's hard to get here. And I just opened it earlier and it's called Life Extension. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> last time I checked, I didn't know that melatonin extended your life. I mean, you could look at the studies and go, okay, well, taking melatonin supplements, but there's a smile and a chance. But the fact that a company is allowed to call itself like life extension and then sell yeah. a supplement yeah. is again an example. I'm not saying it's unethical. I'm just saying like there's, there's, there's a lack of um, rationale and kind of very clear policy checking when it comes mm -hmm. to the way foods and supplements are marketed and sold. And that is, of course, very different in the pharmaceutical categories. And it's very different in the regulated industries. So, you know, when we look at things like alcohol and cigarette marketing these days, it's very, very strictly very moder moderated, controlled. There's very, very tight advertising controls in place. So you can't get away with doing things like having your doctor selling a camel anymore or having a sort of parent selling alcohol and drive, you know, in the, with the kids in the yeah. car. It's very strict. But what we don't get right is, of course, because we don't understand and agree on what a healthy diet is, basically big food can get away with marketing and saying anything they want. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you'll remember, but last year when I spoke at the nutrition summit, one of my proposals was, and, and like the part of the, so I'll give you like the part that I left out because I knew where I was, was like, I didn't want to go into like other diets, but like mm -hmm. there are many. So apparently if you lose 10% uh, of your body weight or something along those lines, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but mm -hmm. a significant amount of weight you can actually reverse your diabetes. It's just really hard to do it when you're not doing a keto, but you can mm. do yeah. it. Um, and you can do it on a super low calorie diet. And then a lot of people, when they're mm. fasting over the month of Ramadan, they reduce their diabetes medication. And so even though, like I still say, like banting is the easiest way because you don't have to restrict your calories. Mm. Mm. At the end of the day, like if you restrict your calories, in other words, if you eat less food, you will, you will improve your health. Okay, mm. that's that, and that's there's like there's gray there, but in general, like that's kind of you know it's mm. kind of accepted mm. knowledge. Mm. And so I I said like we should just not worry about any health claims at all and just make advertising food illegal because no one will die. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you remember the one person who like forgot to mm. eat, forgot mm. to eat mm. in the presence of food and died? Like, uh, anyway, so that, that, that's yeah. a little I mean, way. But obviously, when you start to look at advertising and the role that it plays in the building of civil society, it becomes a lot more complex. So, yeah. you know, that's the other way that marketeers are so effective and penetrative in their strategizing so and in selling their us, products. Is can they you tell sell us more about that? Just to yeah, well, I mean, like so, an example. So if you look at, for example, most big sports sporting events and just look around at the advertising that's you know actually up there on the billboards and around the things and the branding everywhere. In South Africa, alcohol markets those significantly. So there's a large sponsorship from things like beer to also cool drinks. So things like, for example, when you finish your race, you get a free Coca-Cola. It's part of the embedded psychology of actually finishing a marathon or a, certainly I know in cycling it's the same. Um, and that's been happening from a very, very long time ago. It's not a new thing. And it's, yeah. it's sponsorship, which is a form of marketing. So you expect yeah. that Coca-Cola when you get to the end of your race. And if you get a bottle of water or a tap water, you're going to feel cheated. Um, and yeah. you may not support Coca-Cola or drink it in the rest of your life, but that is a huge moment in your life where you associate with that brand in a positive way as you cross, yeah. cross that finish line. The um, cold Coke, the Spur Burger... Um, yeah. And for many people, a glass of beer at the end of the two Absolutely. oceans. Yeah, these yeah. are all like, they're habits. Mm -hmm. They're built in. Like mm -hmm. you start, your mouth starts watering in the last kilometer. You're like, oh, I can taste it. And what yeah. can you taste? Not victory. Yeah. Coca-Cola. No. It's your Coke <laughs> at the end of the race that, that congratulates you on all your good work that you've done. And that yeah. that's deeply embedded marketing. I mean, it's brilliant. You know, mm. it's so simple and it's so brilliant. And what we also see is a lot of marketing. So there's a lot of mandated marketing. So the regulated industries have to put a large amount of their funding into things. So you'll see things like fetal alcohol syndrome will be funded heavily 
by the alcohol industry. Um, a lot of kind of health so health problems associated with smoking will be funded by big tobacco. You know, there's of those those obvious correlations, but then there's the less obvious ones, like the fact that Ronald McDonald, who's no longer exactly as active as he used to be, but he is still more recognized than Jesus or Santa Claus globally as a brand. Wow. And he's also, uh, the majority of the McDonald's funding is in things like pediatric hospitals and um, funding children with chronic disease, for example, which is hugely problematic because what we know is that eating things like fast food and you know, McDonald's and other fast foods regularly causes disease and causes mm. lifelong problems with illness. So there are all these contradictions that are very hard to take away because we don't want to take away funding from pediatric hospitals you know, just because we were on a brand crusade. But at the same time, there hasn't been consciousness and regulation around the way these are approached. Another example, which I have to mention, but I'll talk a lot more about it in my actual talk, is the, um, it's called, what's it called? The Count on Sugar, something like that, campaign, which was launched by one of our local South African sugar companies on World Diabetes Day a couple of years ago. And it's all about how, oh, sorry, it's called the Making Sense of Sugar, that's it. And it's all about how sugar has a healthy role in the human diet. And it's associated with um, sports funding, school educational funding, and it has all these beautiful pictures of sugar canes and children, look, healthy children playing sport, and how like sugar is a healthy part of the human diet. Well, it's not. I mean, we know that. We don't need to go into the debate about it. So why yeah. is sugar doing this? Well, it's obvious why, because it's clever marketing. And it's, it's embedding that perception in the brand's consumer's mind, which is the shopper, which is the mom. She associates, she remembers that sugar cane plant in that ad. And when she goes and buys that big kilogram bag of white sugar, she actually, in some deep subliminal way, actually thinks she's choosing a healthy natural product for her kids. That's mm. insane. So I have to share a story that I just combined while you were telling the story, two different pieces of information and, and like figured it out. So, so the first is that I, I read this. Well, so I'll tell you. Okay. So when I was at McDonald's in 2005 in London, it's totally different to what it's like in South Africa. And, mm -hmm. and, and they had got a lot of heat in the first world for being, you know, so gross, I guess. And so when I went into the McDonald's, it was like a health restaurant. So you go up there mm -hmm. and there's um and there's pictures of salad and then you know that you get the little piece of paper on your tray and so the mm -hmm. piece of paper on the tray in south africa was like a promotion for a, a, a one of these like combos or whatever but there mm -hmm. it was a health guide so it was like because in the uk they're big on your five a day so they're like eat mm -hmm. your five a day mm -hmm. that can be a fruit a vegetable like this this and that drink mm -hmm. um three liters of water there's all the like textbook sort of conventional uh, health advice not one McDonald's product was on that piece of paper. And I remember leaving thinking, wow, it almost like they're trying to add market themselves as a health restaurant. And I carried on with my life like nothing happened. Then a while back, I read this book, um, the, 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 the Willpower Instinct, mm -hmm. and it, which is an incredible book. And they, and they refer to a, a study that they did on, on this thing called uh, goal liberation, okay, which is basically when one part of your brain that has has a goal to stay healthy it gets satisfied by something so in other words the part of your brain that wants the goal feels as though it's achieved the goal and then the other part of your brain takes over for for a brief um, moment and that's kind of what self-sabotage is driven drives self-sabotage mm -hmm. so what and what they found was that if they put healthy items on a menu people were more likely to order the least healthy thing on the menu because for some reason they would be looking at the menu and see, oh, there's salad. I'm in a healthy place. It's yeah. great. And then something so in their brain would be like, cool, you can order something unhealthy now. So McDonald's probably driving consumption by marketing Absolutely. themselves as a health restaurant. Of course. They, I mean, that's the whole thing. They, they, it, it dramatically improved their brand uh, sort of positioning in the market when they started pretending they were healthy. But no one goes to McDonald's for a salad. Trust me, I've tried it. <laughs> I don't know if you have, but it's really bad. <laughs> And that's the whole point. It's hilarious because what, and that's the thing that marketers know is they know how our brains work on a deep level. And I mean, it goes so far as, I mean, I used to work in publishing and magazines and we know where people's eyes go when they look at a magazine cover, you know, and, and, you know, eye tracking is a huge thing. Now, when we look at a screen, we know what consumers are looking at, what they're reading, what they pick up. We know what sells. So we would have about sort of typically, Cut between two and eight magazine covers, and we would eye test them, and we would work out which is the most popular would be, and we'd put that image on. 
you know, and it's of course a typical, it's an attractive smiling face. It's certain things that apply to the demographic. In some cases, it was a spelling error would sell more newspapers. And those are the things that we really understand about consumers. And as a consumer, you need to know this. Like we need to become a little bit more aware of the fact that we're just being constantly sold products to and step back in some conscious way away from that and start to understand what actually is a healthy diet. Like what are we eating right now and how that can be improved. Yeah, and it's everything when we start to really look at our diets. I mean, it's it's hectic. Yeah. I, th I think mm -hmm. if we could all be more intentional, it would make a huge difference. Rather than mm -hmm. responding to adverts, I think like reading the labels and understanding what we really need rather than what, what we're being told we need. And I think that's yeah. a huge undertaking for any individual. It's quite tough. And another thing to look at, obviously, is, of course, the way that age, age brackets are segmented by marketers and how they talk, you know, we think as parents that our kids aren't being marketed to and aren't being mm -hmm. sold products to, but we are wrong. Like, they make their own choices. I mean, so my son is very into sports <laughs> and he I've got it here he actually eats a national cereal product and I kind of buy the really really expensive high protein version of it I'm not going to lip it whip it up but of course on here it says right there smart protein muscle support immune support reduce fatigue and he sits and reads this and it says at the bottom who should use it athletes busy executive active individuals vegetarian sportsmen so that's him sold. He sits and reads it. He wants this. It's the only thing he'd like for breakfast. It's not a healthy product at all, but he believes yeah. that, and that's what he wants. It's and, and I know that cereal just because I'm I'm not like <laughs> at risk for anyone. So what that she's talking about is uh, future life. And I was at a mm -hmm. at a briar and um, not a briar weekend away, and the the family that I was with brought future life along. I actually had a bowl of it because i'd never eaten it before so i just thought like i'm gonna try <laughs> it actually tastes really nice <laughs> like, <Very sweet. laughs> yeah i was like i could probably eat like four bowls of this and not even feel full but it, but the protein mm -hmm. content because it markets itself as high protein mm -hmm. but if i compared the protein of that to the really protein nice. in like uh, eggs and a, you know an mm -hmm. egg tomato mm -hmm. and bacon breakfast or just a piece of grilled fish for breakfast mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that the protein per gram uh, per 100 grams is much higher on on not that Definitely. you know so it's like high, it's high in proteins for a grain product but it's not actually a high protein product and and that's the problem you know the egg doesn't have a little guy jumping out of it saying that you're an athlete or a sportsman and it doesn't advertise itself and the egg industry doesn't advertise itself you know it doesn't yeah. need to or hasn't thought that it needs to but we're stuck mm. in a very difficult situation where people are incredibly brand loyal and they're also pushed and price sensitive and that's a yeah. difficult position to be in as, certainly in yeah. South Africa and globally, that's the case. You know, particularly COVID's kind of tipped that into a new direction as well. So, mm. can you tell us like one or two of the myths that you are going to share? Even if you just tease us with one of the myths from your from your talk. I'm keen. I want to have my mind blown. No pressure. Well, I mean, there's, there's the myth that cholesterol is bad and that eating Ooh. a high fat diet is bad for health. You know, and that is a myth. Well, it's a mistaken belief. Um, there's yep. the myth that salt needs to be reduced in the diet, which comes across in consumer marketing around the world and is so yep. deeply embedded. Um, there's so many others that we're going to talk about. But really, it's most of it is just the, the lack of correct information that consumers have about what a healthy diet is. And it's mm. the myth of the SAD, the standard American diet. <laughs> I mean, that is the, the biggest myth of all. It's a, it's a yeah. relic that still exists. We still believe that we have to eat a base of carbohydrates and refined, you know, highly refined foods and processed foods in our diets. Didn't they and change that to the, didn't, so is that, because the wheel, the nutrition wheel has, uh, has come out in some yes. countries. I, I'm pretty sure it started in Scandinavia. And, and so yeah, is that so, not in America yet? So a couple of countries have come out with it, but it doesn't override the current belief system in the world that marketeers yeah. play on, which is the, and, and we see that, you know, when we look at like the green movement at the moment and the vegan movement at the moment, um, there's a, we're moving much more towards a whole grain diet, towards a high carb diet. We, we're stuck in the low fat paradigm still. And that mm. comes with a high carbohydrate diet, whether it's vegan or the standard American diet or any of those things, until we start to understand very clearly the dangers of excessive carbohydrate intake and, and don't accept that fats are healthy in a normal diet as well as, you know, decent amounts of sodium, then how are we going to change and overturn the, the perception? And that's what children still have. So my son's teacher still checks their lunch boxes and complains if they don't have sandwiches and carbs in, the, in there. 
you know, we're oh, wow. still there. We are still there. And those are still where the guidelines sit in most countries in the world. That's hardcore. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention, so one of the things that the, the marketing marketers will take advantage of is like a perceived health benefit. So when you said um, cholesterol, you know, like the, the, they don't even care. They're, they can't. So even if they stop claiming that cholesterol lowering is good for you, they'll still say mm. on the pack, proven mm. to lower cholesterol. And so you see that mm. and you're like, oh, well, it's proven to low cholesterol must be healthy. Absolutely. But there's no like science there that says having low total cholesterol is going to save no. your life at all. No, no, Crazy. I mean, yeah, and it's, yes, I mean, it goes into everything that we eat, you know, there's just the subliminal, this, there's too much sugar and there's too much salt in this, there's too much fat in this, let's go for the low fat yogurt. Um, we've been programmed in a particular way that hasn't been changed or corrected quickly enough. Yeah. And if we Who's want the... to curb the diabetes tsunami, we're going to have to do something quite quickly about it. Totally you know, we agree. don't have a lot of time to faff around. So the, I just wanted to touch on the salt thing, because in this, we don't often hear about salt. Like, you know, it's, it's said like, mm -hmm. oh, don't worry about salt too much. You need salt if you go keto because you shed water and you lose a lot of um, mm -hmm. electrolytes and, mm -hmm. and magnesium. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what, what's the elements I'm looking for? Sodium. That's it. Mm -hmm. What is the, who is the science guy behind the salt revolution? Is it, is it oh. Dick, Dick Nicolantino? Or yeah, I mean, Dr. James Danilo Calanto is, uh, talks a lot about it. Um, and we, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line is what we see is that the, a lot of people have a sodium deficiency these days. And wow. there's this correlation that's existed for a very long time between hypertension and sodium, elevated sodium levels, which is not entirely correct. Wow. So people are cutting salt and, and eating a lot of that low salt, and which is yep. the sort of more potassium supplemented salt, which is also not necessarily a great thing for your heart to have a very heavy potassium load in your blood. Um, so we just, there's so many mistaken beliefs in, in nutrition. And what we're wanting to do and hoping to do with the World Nutrition Summit is actually bring together different perspectives and have this conversation, like actually thrash it out to some extent. So this isn't a low carb summit for those of you that are coming in from a keto perspective. We've got other people there that are bringing different perspectives in here. And this, it's so important because we've come from a place of finger pointing as this kind of sci the scientific and nutritional communities. And we haven't talked to each other. We haven't sat down and had these conversations and been as inclusive as we could have been. And we know that certainly from a scientific perspective, you know, bio-individuality is incredibly important. So we have to actually look at the differences between different people and what they eat and how like different thing, diets work for different bodies as well. We know that keto works for a lot of people, as you know, but not for everyone. Yeah, totally. So is there, is there anyone from the sad fraternity coming to speak? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of people who, you know, sort of from, who eat like a plant-based diet, who eat a whole foods diet. Um, absolutely. Yeah, there's a couple of good speakers. We've got an amazing type 1 diabetic who reversed his diabetes or dramatically improved his diabetes and came off insulin with a vegan whole foods diet. Um, we've got Catherine wow. Barnhorn and a couple of people talking about childhood eating. So, you know, healthy whole grains are looked at and talked about. Um, we've also got some cooking demos and people that definitely aren't low carb. <laughs> I know you're giving one, which I'm assuming is going to be low carb, or I'm hoping it's yeah. going to be so we get some lovely recipe ideas because yours always so yeah. amazing. Yeah, no, uh, uh, yes. So that's top secret. But um, no, I will <laughs> definitely be cooking, be cooking low carb. I, it's interesting because you know I eat carbohydrates and I, I mean, I don't want to change the subject, but. Um, I kind of feel bad. Like every now and then I have a potato and I'm like, this is a really good potato recipe. I should... And then I just don't share it ever because I'm, <laughs> I'm worried I'll be like shamed on social media. <laughs> well, you're welcome to share it at the World Nutrition Summit. Well, you're an amazing, amazing chef. And you're, you know, the, the idea is always to go, okay, well, how do we feed a family? Well, we do it in an inclusive way. And if there's potatoes in this, you know, give us an idea for how we could trade it out for something low carb. Yeah, but absolutely. Go I think that's the point is to actually start to go, okay, well, this is how we are eating and that's okay. You know, you're alive, you're well, you're healthy, you've been an, you're an incredibly knowledgeable person and you do include carbohydrates in your diet. Great. And how's that working for you? And how does that compare to the people on your programs that are not able to tolerate any carbs? Mm. Uh, let's yeah. let's hear all the stories and actually be, you know, let's not shame or condemn any one food group necessarily. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, so that on that note, I think that keto for many, okay, for some, if you're diabetic, it needs to be, it's kind of like the way it has to be. 
But I think mm. that keto and fasting and, you know, um, fermenting and even plant-based, they're all these different tools to manage our health. And if we develop a really keen grasp of all of the tools, then we're able to do what I call like manage your health naturally. Mm. Um, but, mm. you, you know, just, just because someone has been on a keto diet doesn't mean like them not being keto is them selling out on their beliefs. Yeah. It's just like, well, today that's is not that day and that's not what I need. So I want to... I, I, we're going to give a, a final punt to the World Nutrition Summit. I'm like super pumped about it. I, I love the variety of speakers you have. I'm really excited. I've already booked off. My wife's taking the kids away and I'm basically going to sit um, without snacks Yay. at my <laughs> computer and I'll watch all the talks. I can't wait. Um, but if, if you could please articulate the future that you would love to see as a result of the next sort of 15 years of work that you've got ahead of you, what does that future actually look like? in terms of the fake foods, lies, myths, and, and health? Sure. Well, what I'd love to be seeing is um, that policy and kind of top-down institutions start to take things more seriously and talk to us. So for the last years, we've, we've had to – we've tackled every angle of the nutritional agenda – um, and we've looked at, you know, from a grassroots perspective in our group, we've created Eat Better South Africa that just helps people on the ground – to actually change their lives and eat well and gives them tools as to how to get the, the next generation to eat better. We've looked from a top-down approach at, you know, how from the Noakes Foundation we can influence policy and governmental decision-making to some to, to some degree of success, but largely it's been mostly a challenge because we've been seen as kind of renegades and unconventionalists. Um, and then more recently, obviously, within the, new, the Nutrition Network, we've looked at changing healthcare and how to actually support practitioners to just do the right thing and, and actually support their the people that come to them with disease to get off medication so it's all coming together um but at the same time it's not quick enough so what we're hoping for is the debate to be a lot bigger and for government to get involved you know until policies change and are very much more active and directive things are it's difficult because you're kind of fighting from the ground up and that's a, a great place to be because the ground and the rev that's what you you know the real meal revolution was all about that it revolutionized the way that people chose to eat and that changed industry and changed consumers' mindsets. But we've still got a lot of work to do on that. You know, the banting category and the low-carb category has, has got a lot of work to do in terms of the, the recognition that it deserves in healthcare. Yeah, yeah mm. I totally agree. And even uh, if banting category like sort of stays the same, it'd be lovely to see some of those really unhealthy categories getting reduced. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, like I, I always say, like if you're scared of banting and going low-carb, like, the best thing you do is just cut out the red list. So just stop eating Absolutely. junk and then eat, just eat real foods. And like, you don't have to be banting on keto or anything. Exactly. Just don't eat, exactly. you know, don't eat the full. And we, and the, realistically in 10 years time, you know, our kids hopefully won't have to go to the extremes of only eating the green list. Hopefully they'll never really eat the red list and they'll live long and healthy lives and never suffer from chronic disease like this generation has. That's the yeah. end game. Yeah. yeah. Let's hope in, uh, yeah. in, uh, Homer Deus, um, Yaval, I think his name is Noah Haval Karari or whatever. He says the person, the first person to live to 150 has already been born. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're guys who put like billions of dollars into startups in the States. They want to live forever. So on the one mm -hmm. side, you've got like, it, there's just so many competing forces. But I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure a low refined food diet would be involved in the mm -hmm. quest to live forever. Just mm -hmm. saying, I don't have the science. Absolutely. But and I think there are some things that we agree on. And that's the point. Like, no matter which camp you look at. And often, the, you know, we have the vegans and the carnivores, which I see as like two extreme polarities in the nutritional game. But actually, they have a lot in common. Mm. And that's what yeah. we're going to uncover this weekend, I think. It's yeah. going to be interesting. No, I, I actually agree with you there. I often, I often think mm -hmm. that the vegans... Anyone who cares passionately about nutrition, like that's what they have in common. Um, that, you know, people just standing in different camps. Anyway, Jane, I will let you go. Mm -hmm. I know you've got tons of Thank preparation. Thank you so much. I can't wait to and hear yeah, your talk this weekend and to yeah, chat further. Either. It's going to be so cool. I'm excited. So thank you so much for coming to join us. If you're watching this, click on the link, sign up for the convention, for the summit. You will not regret it. It'll change your life. And it's going, it's going to help fund uh, the Nutrition Network and the Noakes Foundation and EBSA change many, many, many lives. So do the right thing and we'll see you there. You won't regret it. See you there.